Bonjour à tous et donc bienvenue pour ce séminaire de l'Institut d'Astrophysique de Paris. Aujourd'hui, nous avons le plaisir de recevoir David Ehrenreich. David est professeur à l'Université de Genève et il travaille en exoplanétologie. Et ben, je profite justement de ça pour vous faire une petite annonce, pour vous dire que vendredi prochain, euh, ben, nous organisons la troisième nuit de l'astronomie de l'Institut d'Astrophysique de Paris et elle sera justement consacrée aux planètes extrasolaires. Ce sera à partir de 20h sur YouTube. Il y aura des mini-conférences, des animations, de la musique, des dessins, des surprises pour tous les publics, tous les âges, donc n'hésitez pas à nous y rejoindre, de l'IAP comme de l'Observatoire de Genève, on en profite, c'est à distance, donc euh, bah, on peut même y participer de loin. Et donc parmi les spécialités, les thématiques en exoplanétologie, il y a l'étude des atmosphères des exoplanètes, donc thématique sur laquelle David euh, est spécialisé, il travaille beaucoup dans les observations, les modélisations des atmosphères des exoplanètes. David, on le connaît depuis longtemps et on, on s'est rencontré bah, quand il est venu faire un stage à l'IAP il y a une vingtaine d'années, hein, sauf erreur, et euh, par la suite, il est parti travailler pour nous à Johns Hopkins University à Baltimore pour travailler sur Fuse. Et c'était justement à ce moment-là que dans l'équipe, ici à l'IAP, on, on commençait à travailler sur les atmosphères des exoplanètes, avec notamment bah, euh, avec Alfred Vidal-Majar, Alain Le Cavelier, Jean-Michel Désert, avec l'article d'Alfred Vidal-Majar sur la détection de l'évaporation, qui a été publié en 2003. Et David a continué à travailler sur cette thématique par la suite, sur les atmosphères et de manière générale sur les exoplanètes. Il a fait sa thèse donc, dans notre équipe à l'IAP. Par la suite, il est parti travailler à Grenoble et puis à Genève à partir de 2012, où il a obtenu un poste. Il est actuellement donc, professeur et il a développé une équipe autour de lui. Donc, il s'est spécialisé sur les études des atmosphères, euh, l'observation des études des atmosphères des exoplanètes. David est très impliqué également dans le développement d'instruments. C'est un, un gros utilisateur des instruments, donc également euh, depuis l'espace avec Keops ou Hubble, depuis le sol avec la préparation de NIRPS ou maintenant l'exploitation de Expresso. David est également PI de deux gros projets euh, financés par l'ERC pour l'un et par le Fonds national suisse pour l'autre, toujours sur les, les atmosphères des exoplanètes. Il enseigne également à l'Université de Genève. Et donc, bah, ça fait très plaisir de voir que ses travaux débutaient à l'IAP, euh, que par la suite, David a, a développé euh, autour de lui ont autant de rayonnement. Et donc, aujourd'hui, bah, nous t'écoutons pour un séminaire intitulé The Most Extreme Climate in the Universe. In English, please. David. Merci Guillaume. Um, good morning everybody. It's uh, as usual uh, an immense pleasure to be uh, to be with you. I would have uh, hoped to be uh, physically with you, but I guess we will have to wait for the for the next time. So I'm going to uh, put my slides full screen. Can you just make me a sign if you see them correctly? I see yes. Yeah, it's okay. okay. Excellent. All right. So thank you for this uh, this introduction. So I will start um, with uh, uh, basically an artist's impression, uh, which depicts a panorama that doesn't exist in our solar system, not only because the star is blue. Um, so it's an imaginary but physically motivated painting of a sunset on what is the most extreme giant planet known to date. So extreme here means extremely close. Uh, this planet is indeed extremely close to its star, uh, which is bigger and hotter than our sun. And as a result, you would have to imagine that this star uh, would be 70 times bigger than the sun in the sky of this planet. So this image is based on the work that uh, my group has been uh, doing at the University of Geneva for about five years now or so. And our work is questioning the origin, the evolution, and the fate of planets around other stars, which we call exoplanets. And we are focusing for that on their outer layers, which are our uh, observing windows to the physics and chemistry of these worlds, namely their atmospheres. So as uh, Guillaume uh, mentioned, so exoplanetary atmospheres are my main field of research. Uh, but uh, this field today, which is just one of the aspects of the exoplanetary science we are tackling at, at Geneva, is already including several subfields uh, on which my team is working. So uh, we are uh, interested in the uh, atmospheric escape of exoplanets, which is uh, a subfield that was pioneered at IAP, but also in the composition, the dynamics of atmosphere, their cloud coverages, uh, especially for hot gas giants, 
but we go as well uh, looking for the climate of more temperate, maybe more Earth-like planets. So um, this work mainly relies on the scientific exploitation of ground-based and uh, space-borne instruments uh, data, uh, such as the recently launched Chaos Space Telescope, which we operate from the University of Geneva. And these different observations, they allow us to probe uh, different atmospheric layers and draw a sharper and sharper picture of what are undoubtedly some of the most extreme uh, planetary atmosphere that may exist. And to understand why we are focusing uh, on, uh, on extreme atmospheres, uh, let me rewind back in 1995 when uh, Michel Mayor and uh, Didier Collot published the discovery of the first exoplanet around a sun-like star. Uh, their paper was accompanied uh, by commentaries written by peers, so you know, the famous news and views in nature. And so after digging a little bit in the, this historical issue of uh, nature, I exhumed the quotes that uh, I think really captures the essence of uh, their discovery. It's written by uh, Adam Burroughs and uh, Jonathan Yunin, and it goes this way. So with anything living or merely astronomical, questions of origin and survival are central. This is no less true for Maya and Kolo's putative planet, otherwise known as 51 Peg B, and they put it uh, with a big B uh, at, at the time. So why would they write such a thing, emphasizing origin survival? Well, it's because this planet, 51 Peg B, defied imagination. So it's a giant planet like Jupiter, but in contrast with Jupiter, it is found seven times closer to its star than the closest planet is to the sun. So mostly made out of gas, it could certainly not have formed there, not to mention how it could just survive the stellar irradiation. So, Today, we understand how it got there, via the migration in the protoplanetary disk, and how it survives the extreme irradiation. It's simply massive enough to withstand the sustained loss of its atmosphere, demonstrating that planets can exist in extreme environments. However, a planet does not need to live in an extreme environment to be losing its atmosphere. This phenomenon of atmospheric escape affects all planets with an atmosphere, including ours. And the Earth itself indeed sports a hugely extended hydrogen exosphere, as revealed here by this spectacular UV image uh, obtained from a distance of 1.5 million kilometers. The source of the uh, hydrogen that is here shining at uh, Lyman Alpha, uh, the Earth is just here, right, in case you haven't uh, noticed, uh, the source of this hydrogen is water in the lower atmosphere, which gets photolyzed by the UV radiation, showing that exospheric properties can trace molecules that are important to life on the surface of the planet. And this might be actually a way to determine the presence of water on distant terrestrial exoplanets. So before, uh, Going further, let me uh, perhaps give you a sense of scale uh, for the different families of planets that we are going to talk about. So we really need to realize how small an Earth-like planet is compared to a gas giant like Jupiter, and even uh, a small gaseous planet like Neptune. Furthermore, even the biggest planet uh, is dwarfed by uh, our star, making it uh, very clear who is in charge uh, of the solar system. And what I'd like to emphasize uh, with this uh, is that if we are going to look for life on the terrestrial planet, we'd better start furbishing our techniques on giant planets. Now I'd like to introduce you to the one planet population plot that I will be using throughout this presentation. It shows the planet's sizes as a function of the insulation they receive comparatively to the Earth. Solar system planets are divided into three families, gas giants, as ice giants and terrestrial or rocky planets. And these three families, they appear actually quite artificial compared to the amazing diversity of exoplanets, which is the first striking aspect of the several thousands of them we know today. 
The second striking aspect uh, being the high insulation they receive, which is due to the fact that uh, they turn out to be much easier to find very close to their host stars, like 51 Peg B. Now we try to delimit some ill-defined categories with respect to what we know in the solar system. So we have Earth-sized planets, uh, warm Neptunes, uh, and a large family that does not even exist uh, in our solar system, hot and warm super-Earth or sub-Neptunes. We don't really know how to call them. Now, hot Jupiters are the family of uh, 51 Peg B, and in recent years, we started to discover some more extreme members of this family, which are dubbed ultra hot Jupiters. And I, I've been interested in these planets quite a lot. And we have reason to believe that they are uh, significantly different from their slightly cooler siblings. And uh, before uh, showing you some example, uh, I will uh, try to uh, explain you how we study these objects and first, how we measure their sizes. So measuring a planet size is possible when it transits its star as seen from Earth. What you see here is the last transit of Venus of the century in 2012. And I cannot show you this without mentioning the two transits of Venus that occurred in the 18th century. Because in fact, the observation of the 1761 transits of Venus by the Russian scientist Mikhail Lomonosov led to the first detection of an atmosphere around Venus. And uh, eight years later, uh, the transit of uh, 69 was observed from Siberia by a Swiss uh, astronomer named Jacques-André Mallet. And when he came back in Switzerland, he did something which is significant to me, that he funded the Observatory of Geneva. And so in some respects, I owe my position today to this uh, transit of Venus uh, 250 years ago. So today, uh, transits uh, are first used, are mainly used to detect planets and measure their size, which is directly linked with the depth of the transit light curve. We also use a transit still to infer the presence of atmospheres around exoplanets. Besides, uh, transits still justify building observatories, but not in downtown Geneva, in space. So, Keops is uh, ESA's first small mission project. It's a space telescope dedicated to precisely measure the size and density of exoplanets. And you invited me to present the mission at one IAP seminar about five years ago uh, when the mission was in preparation. So now that Keops is launched and performing extremely well, uh, I felt that I should report uh, at least a bit uh, what, what, what is happening uh, today. And so first, I'd like to show you a real image of Keops in orbit, which was taken from a 70 centimeter telescope uh, in Geneva uh, last January. And it's, it's, it's the trail that you can see here uh, transiting across the bright star Eta Aurigae. So this is, this is Keops, a photograph from the ground. And Keops uh, observed this first transit uh, last, uh, last March. So transit of a um, giant planet uh, uh, transiting across a subgiant star. And uh, the precision uh, is, um, is, is it's as precise as we expected. And you may see some wiggles um, remaining in the residual. Well, these are not due to the instrument. These are actual pulsations of the evolved host stars. So the, the inset on the lower right, it shows you the typical one sigma uncertainty that we have on planetary radii that we measure with Keops. So the aim is to bring this level of precision to smaller exoplanets uh, to address the question uh, of the, uh, the, or, the origin of their fantastic diversity. Uh, so one of the most burning questions we have about this diversity of small planets is can you basically form hot, rocky planets by evaporating larger objects? In other words, uh, is there some kind of evolutionary sequence as planets lose their envelope? And such a sequence going from A to B uh, would be um, uh, important to explain the striking dearth of uh, hot Neptunes in the population of exoplanets. 
So for that, we call uh, atmospheric evaporation uh, to, 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 to the rescue. And this phenomenon for exoplanet was basically discovered at IAP. So I will just recall here what we call evaporation. Uh, and it's the atmospheric mass loss that is occurring because uh, of tremendous amounts of X and EUV energy are deposited in the atmospheres of closing exoplanets. So this deposition leads to expansion and dynamical thermal escape of the upper layers of the atmosphere, which is called the exosphere. And the escaping atoms, mostly hydrogen, are repelled by the stellar radiation pressure, they interact with the stellar wind, and they are ionized by the X and EUV radiation, sculpting large envelopes around the planet. And this topic, therefore, lies the crossing between planetary atmospheres, planet evolution, and star-planet interaction. So to find out what's happening to the planetary atmosphere, so its evaporation, the composition, its evolution and dynamics, we basically need to probe them. And when we do that, we need to keep in mind that we cannot benefit for exoplanets from spatially resolving planetary surfaces. So this could be problematic um, because, I mean, the planet that you see on your left is Jupiter, but the planet on your right, it's also Jupiter seen by Juno, but from a completely different angle. So how could we hope to sort things out for worlds that we cannot even really see directly? Well, in spite of that, and the gorgeous details that we have for planets in our solar system, and here you have a close up on Jupiter again by Juno, it turns out that we had to wait for this probe to orbit Jupiter before obtaining a reliable measurement of its water vapor content. And this was just last year. Meanwhile, water vapor could be measured more or less easily on a hot gas giant exoplanet for almost 15 years now. So how come is there this uh, such a discrepancy? Well, the first reason is that uh, known gas giant exoplanets are hot, they are inflated and they move fast, which enhance our remote sensing capabilities. And the second reason is because we have the power of spectroscopy to help us. So when we observe transits with spectrographs, the transit depth, hence the size of the planet, appears to change as starlight is filtered by the planet atmospheric limb, causing a wavelength-dependent extinction. So this extinction depends on the composition and structure of the planetary atmosphere. In the infrared, we are sensitive to the lowest atmospheric layers, which are often obscured by clouds. In the optical, we can probe upper layers. And in the UV, we are sensitive to the outskirts, the exospheres, which can cover a large fraction of the planet host star, resulting in astonishingly large absorption signals. So this is what the first result that I would like to share uh, with you is about. To observe planets losing their atmosphere, we have to uh, observe in the far UV. Uh, this is impossible from the surface of Earth, so we are making a massive use of Hubble. And we are trying to observe uh, UV transits, basically where stars do not have a black body continuum anymore. So the main source of light is the Lyman alpha emission line of neutral hydrogen. And this emission line, however, is very difficult to observe even for Hubble due to the absorption of the interstellar medium. And so only the line wings are available. And this is where we are searching for intransit signatures. So towards the end of my PhD here at IAP, I've become obsessed with a planetary system called GJ436, uh, which is host to the first known transiting warm Neptune. So the star is a red M dwarf, much smaller than the sun. And in the optical, the, the planet occults less than 1% of the stellar surface. But at Lyman Alpha, we discovered something much more spectacular. As the planet gets closer to transit, the stellar flux experiences a strong decrease in the blue wing of the line. And something extreme happens at mid transit where the star is almost entirely occulted at some wavelength and has not recovered fully uh, two hours after transit. So the absorption on the, the maximum occultation depth we measure during the transit is 56%, which is over half the star. So how is that possible to understand? Uh, so first, we have to, to, I have to tell you that our, what our observation constraint is the column density of the material surrounding the planet as a function of time. 
And uh, to understand, we uh, used a particle uh, model, uh, a model called EVE, designed by Alain Le Cavalier and Vincent Bourrier, to model the evaporating exosphere and retrieve the shape of the escaping material around the planet. So this is what the special structure of this cloud looks like, as seen from Earth. And it is way larger than even than the star and sports a leading coma on a prominent tail. But inside, in spite of the cloud size, uh, the implied mass loss rate is not large compared to the planet mass today, but could have been much higher in the past. The power of spectroscopy at the medium resolution allowed by STIS and Hubble uh, made possible to, uh, to retrieve the whole cinematic structure of the exospheric cloud by resolving the absorption signal in, in velocity. And this is shown here in this polar view of the system where the size of the comet-like cloud can be fully appreciated. Now, the detection represents the largest uh, signature for an exoplanet atmosphere to date, and we took great care to make it as robust as possible. So not only is it highly significant, but uh, it's also obtained at different epochs, and the original modeling that we did allowed to predict where a new observation would fall. And two of my PhD students, several years apart, Baptiste Lavi and uh, Leo Dos Santos, analyzed new data obtained with this and another instrument, COS, and both confirm uh, the initial results and the extent of the exospheric cloud. So this uh, result obtained in uh, 2015 was one of the uh, decisive highlights for an international collaboration led by Another, another former member of uh, IAP, David Singh, to obtain what is the largest exoplanet program on Hubble uh, called the Panchromatic Comparative Exoplanet Treasury. So going back to my population plot, uh, the, this Hubble survey con that, that is now over, it was conducted between the 16 and 19, covered about 20 exoplanets in different masses and irradiation regimes. So between uh, IAP and Geneva, we were responsible for the analysis of a large part of the UV data. And uh, we completed that with other smaller programs that we could obtain. And so what I would like simply to highlight here is the first result that we could obtain from the, this UV data set. And it's for a sibling of GJ436b called GJ3470b. Uh, which is slightly less massive, but around the star that is uh, more active than GJ436. And this represents the second case for a largely extended exosphere around a warm Neptune, except that in this case, the larger inferred mass loss rates should have substantially impacted the planet, which could have lost as much as a third of its mass during its two giga years of existence. So this second case clearly shows that warm Neptunes, on top of being an observational sweet spot to detect large signals for atmospheric evaporation, could also be significantly eroded by the stellar irradiation, hinting at a possible new mechanism to form rocky super Earth. Now there is two important limitations: is that the these observations they are limited to a few planets around nearby stars and uh, they can only be carried out in the UV. Uh, so I, um, as such, we, 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 are, we were entirely depending on the future of uh, Hubble, uh, which is the only uh, facility to have this uh, UV access. And one of my long lasting objectives has been to find alternative strategies to mitigate a potential loss of Hubble and continue studying this upper atmosphere of, of, of exoplanets. And uh, for that, uh, the advent of uh, high fidelity, high resolution spectrographs on the ground has provided a whole new and complementary way to look at these upper atmospheres. So by high resolution, I mean around 100,000, which is the typical spectral resolution of, uh, at which planet hunting instruments like uh, HARPS, Espresso, SOFIE, SPIRU, NIRPS, uh, and those that are built typically uh, in Geneva are working. So at such high resolution, the simplified theoretical transmission spectrum of a cloudless hot gas Jupiter, uh, here simulated by uh, my former PhD student Lorenzo Pino would look like that. 
And you see that the optical is dominated by the two resonant doublets of sodium and potassium. And at this resolution, their core, uh, their cores are resolved. So we could use them to probe very high in the planet atmosphere. All of the features that you see here are bands of water vapor. And uh, while the individual lines are pretty weak with respect to sodium and potassium, there is a lot of them. And in principle, we could search for water using cross correlation function. So on top of that, um, these lines, they will all these lines, they will shift around the stellar spectrum due to the fast motion of the planets uh, around the star. And even during a transit, a hot Jupiter can zip by between minus 100 and plus 100 kilometers per second, offering an important way to isolate the planet spectrum from the stellar one. So in 2015, uh, with Aurélien Wittenbach, a PhD student in Geneva, we realized that we could resolve the line profile of sodium in the atmospheres of uh, hot gas giants using HARPS, um, thus improving on what was previously done with Hubble. So our detection in black, when convoluted with the Hubble's TIS instrumental profile uh, shown in red, appeared to be very well compatible with the Hubble data in blue. And uh, the idea of using uh, the sodium doublets to probe the upper atmosphere and its and temperature profile in the upper atmosphere of exoplanet was basically uh, pioneered uh, in 2011 uh, using unresolved uh, STIS data. Uh, so to constrain the temperature profile in uh, HD 209458B. Uh, but with, uh, once we could resolve the line profile, the individual line profile of this uh, with a resolution 20 times better than this, we could uh, exploit it to gain in precision uh, in our temperature profile and uh, obtain uh, a profile like that, that show a large increase of temperature with altitude. And we concluded from this that we detected sodium in the thermosphere of the planets where the temperature rise is caused by the absorption of stellar high energy radiation. So in other words, we are basically at the onset uh, of uh, atmospheric evaporation. So just below the exobase where the atmosphere starts to, to escape. So these results led to the realization that we could take advantage of planet hunting instruments to characterize exoplanetary atmospheres. So between 2016 and 2018, we obtained over 40 nights uh, of open time at ESO to launch HARTS, based survey for hot exoplanet atmosphere at high resolution. And we tried to complement it from the north using HARPS North. Now, one of the most striking characteristics of these ultra hot gas giants is that they are especially amenable to atmospheric characterization. Hence, this family of planets uh, allows for unprecedented glances at the properties of exoplanetary atmosphere. The only thing is that we should be ready for extreme properties. So, uh, in the framework of uh, SPADE, so the survey we led with uh, Harps North, uh, we studied KELT 9b, which is the most irradiated gas giant known to date. It receives about 40,000 times the Earth insulation and is so hot that uh, Jens Wimakers, uh, then a postdoc in my group, was able to detect vapors of iron and titanium in this planet atmosphere. Ultra hot Jupiters are also the targets of a survey performed within the KEOPS Guaranteed Time program. Uh, this survey aims in particular at characterizing the day sides of this planet. 
So photometry during primary transits of, uh, so one of these planets was 0.89b uh, measures uh, the size of the planet, as I explained. Um, and uh, well, here the transit actually looks asymmetric due to gravity darkening on the surface of the star. Um, but it's possible to do to do to go to go much farther and to detect the light that is either reflected or emitted in the case of a very hot planet in the optical. For this, you need to observe the occultation of the planet by the star. And this causes a tiny dip in the stellar light curve, revealing how much light the planet uh, emits in this band pass. And Keops measured this dip with a delightful precision of 88 plus or minus four parts per million, uh, implying extremely high temperature of over 3,400 Kelvin on the planet day side. And these temperatures, they are able to vaporize any clouds, even made out of metals. So the day side temperatures uh, of these uh, planets are commensurate with those of cool stars. Indeed, uh, Kitzman et al. and others have proposed that this would result in a pristine chemical composition at the chemical equilibrium for these atmospheres, which would be made out essentially of atoms and ions resulting from the dissociation of most molecules. So to detect uh, atomic iron and titanium on kelt 9 b Jens Wimakers performed the cross-correlation of the many lines that these atoms have in the optical band, resulting in a cross-correlation function that can be seen as a kind of average line. So we used the template models of the planet transmission spectrum and cross-correlated these with the Harps North spectra. Now the figure here shows one cross-correlation function per line and the peak of the cross-correlation function can be seen moving with time following the radial velocity trajectory of the planets during the transits. When we switch to the reference frame of the planet and co-add all these individual cross-correlation functions, we could obtain an outstandingly significant detection. And indeed this approach to four species initially, uh, iron, iron plus, titanium, titanium plus, before realizing that we could basically attempt to detect the whole periodic table. So all species shown here could have been detected in what constitutes uh, some the, an atlas for uh, this exoplanet. Now, all of this could have been done uh, using excellent spectrographs installed at four meter class telescopes. So going for more powerful settings would allow us to go beyond the simple census of chemical species in an exoplanet and perhaps try, if not to spatially resolve the surface of this planet, maybe to spectrally and temporarily resolve them. So the new espresso spectrograph at the, at the VLT that the hottest point is offset towards the evening terminator. Indeed, such longitudinal offsets are often seen in hot Jupiters as a result of superrotational equatorial jet streams. However, our model needs, uh, instead of a superrotational jet stream around the planet, a day to night circulation at both limbs. And uh, how to achieve that? Well, these objects day side are so hot that molecules break into atoms, which then get ionized. So this is what we saw for kelt 9 b And the strongly ionized atmosphere could feature strong electromagnetic currents that could inhibit, through electromagnetic drag, an efficient circulation around the planet. As a result, the literature expects 
strong temperature differences between day and night and a main, a mainly day to night circulation. Such uh, winds would cause a blue shift at both limbs again, if and only if there is iron there. So we added this blue shift in our toy model, conveniently setting the wind speed so that it would compensate the red shift on the leading limb. But it shall increase the blue shift on the trailing limb. So now if we take this uh, Frankenstein model and make it to transit, uh, we, will see the, we will expect to see the following thing. So here I attract your attention to the fact that during the transit, you have an inset, a zoom here on the planet. You, you have the impression that the planet is rotating and this is just a geometrical effect, which is due to the fact that the curvature of the orbit is very strong because the orbit is so tight. So you will see a, a, a rotation of the planet during the transit. And this is key to understand what's happening. So at ingress, the leading limb contains iron uh, and produce an absorption around zero kilometers per second. Meanwhile, the trailing limb, which also contains iron, enters the stellar disk and starts to blue shift the signal. Quickly, however, iron disappears from the line of sight through the leading limb, so that during transit, the signature at zero kilometers per second disappears. Only the blue shifted trailing limb contributes. And it does so until the end of the transit, so that nothing happens when the leading limb ex exits the stellar disk. Overall, this scenario could be compatible with our observ observations. And so we published it a year ago uh, in Nature. But of course, uh, I was just mainly waving my hands here. Uh, and it needed to be confirmed by 3D climate models of ultra hot Jupiters. Um, but uh, also importantly, uh, it was uh, the signal of iron absorption was independently confirmed recently by another team uh, using our very own HARPS public data actually on this planet that we did not thought could, could show this signal, but it, it does. Their detection is clear and very well compatible with what we have with Espresso, but of course at a smaller signal to noise ratio. And it would seem that uh, as of last week, uh, our interpretation can also be confirmed as a team uh, from Oxford, uh, including uh, Vivien Parmentier, uh, retrieved our signal theoretically by modeling uh, the planet with a very asymmetric day and night. And by, by asymmetric, I mean geometrically asymmetric, as you can see here, with a much puffier day side including a very strong variation in the iron mixing ratio by orders of magnitude on the night side. So to summarize, uh, we detected iron vapor at the evening twilight of uh, an ultra hot Jupiter, but not at its morning twilight. Therefore, iron must have condensed across the night side. So it's thus either raining or maybe snowing iron on the night side of these extreme planets. Now to finish uh, and to maybe try to cool down from these extreme uh, climates, I will try to go to more temperate uh, conditions, uh, but uh, going for planets in temperate or habitable zones. Uh, but as we try to reach this world in this diagram, you can see that the, the, the path is pretty long to reach them. Notwithstanding, in 2006, I and several uh, people, uh, some of them attending this conference, we claimed that uh, observing the atmosphere of an Earth-like planet would require a 40-meter telescope. Uh, this, such a telescope is now being built. Uh, and of course, I'm looking forward to, uh, to it. And in particular, the advent of the second generation instrument called IRES, for which um, transmission spectroscopy of Earth-like planets is the main scientific driver. And this asks several questions. So what, uh, what planets we will have to, to look at, what species in the atmosphere of this planet we, we will need to search for. Um, so before trying to, 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 to give some, some, some hints, uh, I just like to rewind a little bit. Uh, to make the point that planets and exoplanets, as we are now seeing, are complex and structured objects. And we have reached the point through, in particular, but not exclusively the results that I've shown, that 
we need three-dimensional approach to their characterization and modeling. So a great tool to achieve that uh, is phase curves that allows uh, scrutinizing a planet under all angles. And while we are certainly going to try as much as possible in the optical with KOPS, it's really most efficient in the infrared using spectroscopy. So the best example I know is this impressive Hubble observation of a hot gas giant, but it is certain that uh, the James Webb Space Telescope and the Ariel mission, they will shine at bringing more of these uh, phase curves. So now where to, through, through which part of the diagram to go, to go to lower, to lower masses? Well, somehow we've already decided to go through the hot Neptune desert or more precisely through its fringes to better understand what is happening to exoplanets living there. Uh, we've been trying already to go down in exoplanet mass with uh, Hubble, Espresso, Keops, and we shall continue to try with the JWST. Yet uh, our detection of atmospheric escape around the warm Neptune asks down to which mass and up to what distance from the star we could still hope to see this effect in the UV. And the idea of using hydrogen escape to trace the signature of evaporating oceans on terrestrial planets is certainly tantalizing, but it can only be applied to planets within about 50 parsecs and would require a substantial time investment on Hubble, or perhaps the rise of a future flagship UV mission such as LUVOIR. Uh, and this was quantified and demonstrated by uh, Leo dos Santos uh, in a paper uh, about that. And that being said, um, Leo dos Santos already obtained actually a hint of hydrogen escape detection for a planet, so mini Neptune in the habitable zone of its, of its star. So in principle, it could really work. Uh, but perhaps another easier and more immediate tracer is the near infrared helium signature, which is detected from space and exquisitely confirmed from the ground uh, with high resolution spectrograph here, such as Carmen S, but now Spirou uh, has been able to achieve that as well. And this line uh, will be also very well covered by NIRPS, the upcoming spectrograph that will complement HARPS in the near infrared. And the NIRPS will, the, the GTO on NIRPS will represent 700 nights of observation. And so this is a fantastic opportunity to carry out the largest survey for exoplanetary atmospheres to date. So such a survey could realize a census for helium in more than 100 targets uh, with an important coverage of planned James Webb targets. So without the distance limitation of Lyman Alpha, helium could become a spectroscopic beacon for most exoplanets with primary atmospheres, not just gas and ice giants, but also mini Neptunes and early terrestrial planets having retained their primordial atmospheres. Finally, and I'm almost done, uh, as we are fencing the prospects uh, to characterize Earth-like planets, we must not forget this uh, cosmic coincidence that true Earth analogs around sun-like stars are probably the most difficult planets to find, whatever the technique used, at the notable exception perhaps of microlensing, but then I'd like the planet to be close by around the bright star as well. And this issue becomes outstanding uh, if we try to find indeed bright and nearby Earth analogs amenable to characterization. So it might seem from this diagram that we have plenty enough exoplanets already, but if we only keep these stars brighter than a VMAG of 12, then a VMAG of 10 and eight, you see that we just don't have enough. And this is the reason behind missions like TESS, KEOPS, and eventually PLATO, which should deliver several characterizable Earth-like planets. So I will finally lay down all these facilities uh, in a timeline, and uh, I, will, uh, I will stop here and be uh, happy to take uh, any question uh, that you might have and discuss further with you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, David, for this very nice uh, presentation. So is there any question in the audience to David? I'm looking. Uh, that goes back. Alan, no question? Yes, Alan, please. Uh, 
First, thank you very much, uh, David, for this uh, very, very nice presentation, uh, very enlightening, and uh, I appreciate it very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, really. Uh, I have a question about the planet uh, WASP 76b. Uh, this planet, uh, you have the broad uh, sodium line. And I wonder if you could uh, extract the TP profile, temperature pressure profile from this uh, sodium line detection with the uh, broad wings. So yes, we have we have done that. So it's in a, a paper by uh, by uh, Seidel et al. Um, and uh, but but actually we tried uh, we tried also in addition to a, to a temperature profile we we tried to put winds as well. Uh, several kinds of winds, including uh, uh, winds, vertical winds in the in the in the upper atmosphere of the planet. And what uh, Yulia uh, found is that uh, these winds are actually doing a better job at explaining the broadening than the the temperature than, than than a strong temperature increase in the upper atmosphere. So. Um, the, because she's using a kind of a Bayesian framework model with a lot of free parameters, we are, we are very uh, rapidly limited by the signal to noise ratio. And we are actually uh, in the process of doing that again with the Espresso data, which shows a, a, better, uh, a better SNR. And so you, you still need a temperature rise, but not as strong as previously uh, envisioned. If you if you add if you add winds to it. Thank you. Thank you, Peder Martioli, please. Yes. Um, so thank you for for this nice uh, review and talk. Uh, I was uh, thinking um, you 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 showed us some examples of uh, very hot ultra hot Jupiters uh, where you you show some detections and and then you showed a couple of examples of uh, um, evaporating sub Neptunes. Uh, so that usually the, the hot Jupiters uh, uh, I don't know all of them uh, that you you showed but uh, they have very hot stars they are around uh, hot hosts. Uh, and the evaporating uh, sub neptunes there around M dwarfs. So I was wondering about the whole, the role of uh, uh, the host star in this, uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, planet that you can detect and what are the features more uh, relevant for uh, in this uh, atmospheric detection uh, compared to the, 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 the temperature of the host star. So the host star is, uh, is, uh, is fundamental to, uh, to, 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 the, to, the, to, to the fate, uh, with respect to the fate of the planetary atmosphere. And in fact, it's expected that planets that are closer to, 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 to very hot stars, they will suffer more. Uh, in reality, it's not that simple because there are different regimes of atmospheric escape. And it can be that if you are too irradiated, you uh, surprisingly, you could in inhibit, uh, inhibit the, the, the escape. But, uh, observationally speaking, uh, it's difficult actually, it's more difficult also paradoxically to study atmospheric escape around, uh, of, uh, for instance, hot gas giants around very close to their stars. It's more difficult that for, for uh, warm Neptune around M dwarfs. One of the ways to understand that is that if you have uh, strong evaporation, uh, it's, you also have a strong uh, radiation pressure, for instance, from the star. And uh, this radiation pressure can sweep away very efficiently the, the clouds of, of hydrogen escaping the planet. So instead of building up these huge clouds looking like comets that, you, that we see around the warm Neptune, uh, you have a much uh, more focused uh, uh, tail. And this is much more difficult to, 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 to observe. And so paradoxically, it's been easier to detect uh, that around uh, least irradiative, plan irradiative planet than around the most irradiative ones. Okay, uh, and uh, on still on a related topic, uh, this big clouds uh, around the sub uh, are they uniquely hydrogen or could they carry some other like helium or some molecules? So we, we search for that uh, using COS in particular, but we did not find uh, any significant signature of, 
for instance, uh, neutral oxygen or ionized carbon. So probably, but we haven't detected them uh, for these planets. Uh, now for hot Jupiters, there are detection of uh, O and C. Okay. Thank you. There is a question by Clément Rank, but he doesn't know how to, to raise the end. Clément, yes, please. So thank you for this talk. Um, actually, I have a very general question. Uh, your sound is cutting, Clément. Can you, can you repeat, please? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. You, you mentioned it a little bit. Uh, the, you mentioned the link between the um, uh, planetary formation, the link we can make between planetary formation and the study of uh, atmospheres. And I was wondering if you would like to maybe to comment a little bit more on that because it, it was a bit short. What kind of links, yeah, generally speaking, we can make? Uh, you, sp you spoke about like the evaporating uh, uh, atmosphere that can uh, explain the formation of or the existence of super Earths from uh, form from giant planets. So I don't know. I, I would be curious about uh, yeah what what you think about the, the yeah the, the the bridges that can be uh, made. So uh, what, what is clear, uh, but for, for some time now, is that you cannot form like an Earth, a rocky planet by evaporating a, a giant planet like Jupiter. There is just too much gas to, 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 to evaporate. And, and uh, even very close to the star, you cannot do that. So uh, as years passed, we have tried to, uh, to constrain what could be the masses of the progenitors that could lead to uh, to, to the observational evidence is the, in the population of uh, exoplanets. For super-Earth, there seems to be two populations of super-Earth separated by uh, a, a, a valley, a gap in, uh, in radius. And planets uh, above this radius, they seem to have retained some kind of primordial envelope, whereas planets under this uh, gap seem to have lost it. And so it's been surmised that uh, the, the first one, they could, they could evolve in the second one uh, if, they are, if they are in the good condition, if they're close enough to, to the stars. And uh, so the detection of a significant evaporation rate on one of the warm Neptune I talked about, GJ 3470b, seems to go in this direction that indeed these planets, which is likely a few giga years old, in, in 10 giga years, it will be definitely uh, shrinks uh, because of its, uh, of its mass loss. So it seems that it's a, a viable path, but what we would be, uh, would be really, really critical now is try to observe young planets uh, before they can lose their primordial envelope, even young Earth-like planet, for instance, and try to determine what are the time scales depending on the stars uh, where on which they could lose the, the, the they could lose their envelope, and for that the helium signature is very promising. Thank you. Yeah. Jean-Pierre Maillard. Yes. Uh, so thank you for an interesting uh, presentation, but I have a comment and a question. So you didn't mention at all. So a recent paper which have been uh, presented. So, which about it was uh, the from uh, uh, Carmen and the uh, Espresso high resolution spectra for the transiting uh, planet, which is the well known, which was the very beginning, first transit uh, 209458B, uh, uh, and which uh, put the question from a uh, very precise treatment of the high resolution spectra of the detection of sodium. So you, what do you think about that? You, I imagine you know this, you know this paper. I'm the Espresso one, I'm probably a co-author of it. Uh, so I, are you referring to the one that is questioning the, the detection with, uh, with Hubble? No, 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 so. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. yes. Okay, so indeed, 
uh, it seems that uh, so at high resolution uh, we can see uh, the impact of the rossiter mclaughlin effect on the transmission spectrum. And this impact has to be, uh, it has to be taken good care of. Now, this impact, it's, uh, it, it's mostly problematic when you have, uh, so the rule, of th the, the rule of thumb is that if your rossiter mclaughlin effect is very strong and, and, and very clear, then it's going to be a problem for your transmission spectrum and you need to correct for it. So this is the case for HD 209458B. And it would seem that indeed, if you take this effect into account, uh, it questions uh, at least partially the earlier detection that were obtained with this uh, on this on this planet. But it does not question the detection that have been made on its uh, sibling uh, planets uh, HD 189733b, for instance, because or WASP 76b, uh, which I've shown, because. Uh, here, the Rossiter is, 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 not, is not a very, um, has not a very strong amplitude, so it's not going to pollute your spectrum uh, very much. But it is true that uh, thanks to high resolution spectroscopy, we, we could uncover effects that were only, that were not really taken into account at medium resolution. And that, uh, yes, that should be. Now the question is, are these uh, STIS observations really sensitive to it, or are you seeing just the wings of the lines? Uh, so it can be debated, but I would agree uh, certainly that it needs to be considered. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So if there is no more question, I propose we stop here for the official recorded uh, IAP seminar. So we can continue after of the record. So.